All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Does that sound good with everyone? Yeah. Great. All right. Hi, everyone. So thank you for joining us today for our virtual zine reading and discussion. Um, as some of you probably already noticed, and for those of you who are just joining in, we're recording this event to share later. We'll also be editing it. Though, um, if you don't want to be recorded, please make sure to keep your video off for the duration of the event. We do welcome people to turn their video on so we can actually see each other's faces and who's in the room. But just as a note that if you don't want to be recorded, just to keep it off. Um, and then everyone, please make sure that your microphone is turned off at this time. Um, you can turn it on when you're speaking later in the discussion session. And then for people who are speakers, just turn yours on when it's your turn to speak. But um, as a default, everyone's microphone should be off right now. Um, so just some brief introductions of who I am. My name is Rachel Kuo. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm one of the co-leaders of the Asian American Feminist Collective, and I'll be moderating the conversation today. So the Asian American Feminist Collective, for those of you who are just encountering us for the first time, part of our work is to foster community dialogue and practices that politicize the intersections of Asian American identities across social justice issues. So feminist media making is part of how we build community and our zines are a central way to how we express our political vision. And so you can download and print all of our zines on our website, asianamfeminism.org under the resources page. Um, and just some context and background for this event. Um, a lot of my own media practice and writing has been focused on Asian American politics and the different uses of digital media and technology to build solidarities across unequal difference. And our most recent scene, Asian American feminist antibodies care in the time of coronavirus was a way to practice rapid response in a way that's really driven by longer term movement visions. And so something that we've seen in this moment, right, is that the rhetoric of Asianness as contagion has been a huge part of our media and information environment surrounding COVID-19. But what we also know, right, is that anti-Asian exclusion, both past and present, is really bound up in projects of racial violence that stem from white supremacy, racial capitalism, and anti-Black racism. And so our zine includes a collection of stories from people who are experiencing racist incidents in the day to day um, during the pandemic that is situated alongside writing from different social movements and campaigns. So we have writing from people organizing on decarceration and prison abolition, domestic workers and sex workers rights, language access, disability justice, just to name a few. And so the aim of this is really to position to create a way to cultivate political solidarities and coalition building in this moment. And we really wanted to try and make sense of how histories of race has markedly shaped disparate experiences of disaster and also to highlight community resiliency, interdependency and care in the midst and wake of crises. So it's been a month, less than a month since we released the scene. And I think what continues to become really clear during this pandemic is that the rampant existing inequalities of how people are accessing wellness and safety. And so for example, I'm in Chicago right now when we found as the racial breakdown data has been revealed, right, that the majority of those who are infected and dying are from black communities. And so we're really also seeing the importance of how community-based mobilization and creating mutual aid networks um, alongside the depth and breadth of collective knowledge, histories, languages, and experiences, and beginning to shape how we can build coalitions, networks of solidarity and support for one another. And so our event today brings together health practitioners, community organizers, and artists to discuss the zine's theme of revolutionary love and care towards liberation, and also again around the possibilities and necess necessity of coalition and solidarity that can continue and emerge in this moment so we can build more interdependent communities of resistance. Um, so that's just a, a brief intro and just to give you some context of what the event will look like today. Um, the first half of the event will feature readings and comments by different contributors, and then around 6.30 we'll move and have a moderated Q&A and open discussion, and I'll share some more details on the format then. Throughout the event, feel free to use the, uh, the chat function um, to raise any questions, share your thoughts throughout, and we can also draw on those for the discussion portion as well. And then we'll close out um, at the end at 7 p.m. Uh, with a breathing exercise together. Um, so as a note on how we can care for each other in this space, like we have some community agreements that we use when we share space together. So that should be um, the next slide. 
on there and we adapted these from the aorta collective and so really briefly there are they are speaking from your own experiences being open to learning and committed to each other's growing move up move up move up by either speaking more or listening more depending on what's your default and also honoring people's pronouns and gender identities and so if you see the ellipses in the right corner of your video screen you can also find the option to rename yourself and so you could put in your name and pronouns that way and you can also react by sharing a thumbs up or a Tap if you agree with these community agreements. Okay. Um, also, as those of you who entered early, you know that this is our first big Zoom event as the Asian American Feminist Collective, so be gentle with us as we navigate the space together. Um, what I'll do is introduce each speaker prior to their comments, and in advance, um, what I'll do is also thank everyone for all of you for joining us tonight. Um, hold on, I'm using, thank all of you for joining us tonight. I also really want to thank my fellow collective members at AAFC, Tiffany, Julie, Saloni, and Senti, who are providing a lot of the technical and emotional labor of holding this virtual space together. And a huge, huge thank you to our partners at Blue Stockings Bookstore, Cafe, and Activist Center for co-hosting. So the first person I'm going to pass it on to is Matilda Sabal. Uh, Matilda is a collective member at Blue Stockings where they lead the shop's health programs. They originally were the ones who reached out to AFC to instigate the zine project and none of this would be possible without their brilliance and thoughtfulness and it's been really, really incredible collaborating with them. They are a disabled artist and grassroots healthcare activist in New York City and also co-organized Too Young to Be Sick, a support network for young adults with chronic illnesses and disabilities. There we go. Hi, thank you so, so much. Um, so I'm here um, representing Blue Stockings Bookstore, which is um, a intersectional feminist bookstore and radical hub in the Lower East Side. Um, it's collectively run. It's been uh, there for 21 years now. Um, and this is uh, part of our move to digital programming um, because even though our physical space is closed, um, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to share our resources and um, keep act alive our activist community while we are um, physically distancing. Um, so for me, this project started um, as a project about witnessing. I emailed the uh, Asian American Feminist Collective on February 22nd to see if they would be interested in a zine project that recorded um, the experiences of violence and harassment that I had started to see around me um, with a, a lot of those first incidences being um, directed towards uh, international students uh, at the place where I'm getting my MFA. Um, and so you just, <laughs> before the pandemic, I was doing art about accessibility. Um, the crux of that work was a reminder to um, abled folks that accessibility is necessary, not just because you should care about other people, um, but because anyone can become disabled. And if you are lucky enough to grow old, it is likely that you will in one way or another. Um, and I wanted to highlight the ways in which systems like health insurance, universities, and social services are designed to punish and fail sick and disabled people. Um, Today, um, coronavirus has laid bare some of the really hard truths that disabled people and other marginalized people have already known. Um, in starting the zine, um, for those of you who have read it or who hopefully will read it, um, we start out with a history of public health and xenophobia and um, sort of historically, and then we also open it with a snapshot of our own administration's early, early failures. Um, but by doing this, we wanted to remind people that the medical abuse, neglect, and the lethal mismanagement of the current epidemic are at the hands of the US government is not a unique phenomenon, but rather it is another deadly piece of brutal and remorseless legacy um, about how the state has failed us um, as citizens or as non-citizens, um, but as people. So since I wrote, that email in February, um, a lot has changed. We are much more limited in our mobility now and the dangers that our communities are facing both from illness, but also from state violence have increased. Um, and I'm really interested in how this project's scope and meaning will continue to evolve with the situation. Um, and I truly, truly feel lucky to have been part of creating this scene and of building cross community solidarity with the Asian American Feminist Collective. Um, 
and for hope continuing that work hopefully in the future. Thank you so much for Matilda for working with us and sharing this space with us. Um, the next person that we'll pass it on to is Saloni Bauman, who is a co-leader at the Asian American Feminist Collective. Saloni is our resident historian and she'll be sharing some historical context around public health and racism with us today. She is a PhD candidate in history and also women, gender and sexuality studies at Yale University. And her research explores struggles for social provision during the first years of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And so I personally feel so lucky to know Saloni. Um, she's such an amazing person to think and build with. So very excited to pass it on over to her to read um, a little bit poetically from our historical timeline and to share some thoughts. Yes, so thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I feel so grateful to have been able to work with both Matilda and Rachel and Tiffany and everyone we collaborated on um, with this scene, but it kind of kept me sane in those first couple days of quarantine and sort of the world changing so rapidly to have a project um, to focus on with such generative, um, wonderful, creative, thoughtful, space holding colleagues and friends. Um, so I'm very grateful. Everyone can hear me, right? Always making sure. Great. Um, so I'm just going to read from the timeline really quickly and um, I'll just kind of go through this poetic reading, which is a a little bit of a funny way to say it, but, um, and then share some thoughts at the end. But I, I hope some themes will emerge for everyone. So 1492, infectious disease from European colonization begins to eliminate native people. In 1875, the Page Act is passed. Chinese women barred from entering the United States, depicted as sex workers uh, who would transmit Chinese diseases to their white clientele. 1882, Chinese Exclusion Act passed after multi-year campaign to stereotype Chinese immigrants as undercutting American wages, untrustworthy, and more likely to carry cholera and smallpox. 1889, the Philippine-American War and U.S. military occupation uh, continue for three years, actually. Coercive quarantine, inspection, and detention program against sex workers in the Philippines accused of spreading venereal disease. 1901, a plague epidemic in San Francisco. Chinese and Japanese Americans are quarantined in Chinatown. Um, oops. Um, while white folks are allowed to move freely. 1918, the Spanish flu claims over 50 million lives, many of them colonies under European management. 18 million people die in India because of British negligence. Anti-colonial resistance grows in this flu's aftermath. Um, 1939, 181,288 people die of TB in the US. Um, and there's striking racial disparities in those who are affected. Black and brown people die, or black people die at 3.5% percent the rate of white people and Indians, Chinese, and other races, which is a census category at double that rate. Um, 1979, HIV AIDS initially understood by public health officials to only affect white gay men. People of color and women are excluded from early drug trials, studies, interventions, benefits programs. Officials shut down bathhouses and pornographic theaters. Politicians remain resistant to harm reduction services, restricted immigration to the U.S. based on HIV status. Um, 1991, detention camp created at Guantanamo Bay for Haitian refugees who test HIV positive. Um, 1985, 1975, there's a fiscal crisis. Major budget cuts to services and screening in East Harlem, Chinatown, and the South Bronx causes a TB resurgence um, in New York City, and especially in poorer neighborhoods, once again affecting black and brown populations disproportionately. 1990, street vendors portrayed as a threat to public health and safety, targeted by New York City Mayor Giuliani's quality of life reforms. 2005, Hurricane Katrina kills uh, 1,833 people and leaves millions homeless and displaced. New Orleans exposed to toxic pollution from neighboring hazardous sites. In 2006, Vietnamese American youth activists work in coalition with black allies to close a toxic landfill in the Versailles neighborhood. In 2009, H1N1 spreads. Conservative commentators in the US fanned racist and xenophobic claims that Mexican immigrants brought the virus across the border. And in 2014, perhaps most in all of our living memories, Ebola breaks out in West Africa. Eight cases are confirmed in the US. Virulent anti-Black racism spreads. Travel bans are proposed rather than public health support or any sort of global leadership. Um, so I know that was kind of a rapid timeline that we went through, but um, what we were really hoping to do in assembling all of those facts is one, um, think through contagion and state responses and state neglect to contagion in a longer timeline than just the 20th century. Um, 
As you'll kind of notice as this timeline continues, uh, racialized bodies are often seen as the vectors of disease rather than white bodies. And uh, we kind of wanted to destabilize that notion with our first timeline point, right? Um, Native communities are really decimated by white settler infection and contagion. Um, and we also wanted to kind of interplay the fact that some of these are exceptional instances of violence and um, contagion and emergency like the one we're in right now, but several of them are also kind of everyday instances of violence um, and uh, tolerated degrees of vulnerability that the state is comfortable with certain populations being exposed to like toxic waste or air pollution. Um, I had a friend who was, we were just reading that um, the BCG shots, which many of us have if you were born elsewhere, not in the US, um, might be an early kind of immunity booster to the coronavirus. And it was kind of interesting, but someone said, oh, we've eradicated TB in the US for so long. Um, and that's actually not true. TB remains um, a major uh, killer of many poor people. It's the number one killer in most homeless shelters still. Um, and the fact that we kind of carry around with us this idea that we as a nation are somehow immune to it is really a manifestation of this kind of state neglect um, where certain bodies are much more vulnerable to disease. Um, I hope you'll excuse how fast I, I spoke, but um, I'll kind of pass it off to our next speaker. But I really do think that these histories of public health and racism intertwine. And yesterday we, you know, we saw the president tweet out that he's using this moment to um, end all immigration to the United States, according to some executive order that may or may not be passed. And I was struck by the fact that so many brilliant thinkers and all of us thinking together have thought about this moment as a way to envision what we want the future to look like and what possibility there is to build something from all the flaws this is exposed in our social safety net. Um, I think it's so critical that we remember that the other side is also envisioning a different future to come from this moment and working towards building that themselves. And that's kind of where the rubber hits the road on these things. So um, thanks for bearing with my historical timeline and I'll pass it back to Rachel to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Saloni. Um, so next we have Olivia on. Um, so AFC, we first got to meet Olivia in the context of building around immigrant justice and healing justice. So we're really excited to have them share their poem, Ten of Wands, with us today and share more on their healing practices. Olivia is a community-based healing practitioner and visual storyteller in New York City, centering QT BIPOC people and families. They are honored to follow the lineage of Korean Chinese diaspora and queer indigeneity. indigeneity. They humbly serve in the spirit of their ancestors. So I'll pass it over to Olivia now. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'm just gonna start reading um, the passage that I had um, offered to the team. And I appreciate the historical context that um, Saloni provided because um, it is my belief that Colonialism is like the original inf the original infection that we all must grapple with, and that's kind of the thesis to this poem. Um, and I also attribute some of that um, historical critique to other indigenous artists, um, such as like Damien Dina Yazi, who has a project called like Positive Since 1492, and attributing um, how we are classified as vectors for disease as like queer and trans indigenous people. Um, and so, yeah. All right, I'm gonna start reading. <laughs> 10 of Wands. The world is overextended and capitalism is its burden. The times are telling that for the sake of humanity, that the system must bend, but it won't unless the economy is truly at risk. Never people. These extenuating circumstances have made it bend, if only for just a moment. They do not see where they are going or why. They only think of their responsibility and allegiance to the currencies of crypto-colonialism. The system is not broken. It is working perfectly and the algorithms are as strong as they ever were. We must continue to love each other, fight for each other and protect each other fiercely as we have all been doing and will continue to do. 
Do not let them possess your heart or stomp out the capacity to compassionately see into the hearts of others. Share the medicines of your ancestors with your kindred and chosen family. May you do it justly and honorably. Continue to nourish and heal the wounds of the subconscious unknowing. Colonization is the ongoing infection that we must continuously combat collectively. So who thrives? Who dies? Whose bodies matter? Whose health matters? Whose labor matters? Who is an acceptable vector for disease? Who is a most reliable scapegoat? Whose turn is it to be blamed? Who is protected? And who is expected to do the protecting? Silence equals death. Um, so that is my piece, and it was actually inspired by some of the spiritual healing work that I do with my community, and it's a combination of um, spiritual counseling through Reiki um, and Tarot and Oracle cards, as well as other forms of um, like Oracle reading, like with chim sticks um, and firework and water work. Um, and these were some cards that I had pulled prior to shelter in place that was kind of articulating the escalation of all of this. Um, and the 10 of wands that I found in two decks that um, are some of the oldest in the tradition of tarot is the Raider Waite and the Thoth tarot. Um, in the Raider Waite, it's a depiction of a person carrying 10 wands and the wands is the suit of fire in this tradition. Um, which lends itself to also correspond to the astrological alignments of Sagittarius and Saturn. And in the Thoth Tarot, um, this also corresponds to the indication of an oppressive force that Saturn inhabits in the third um, decan of Sagittarius. Um, and this lends itself to um, kind of mirroring aspects of when one uses force and nothing else by which to reach an outcome. In the same way, this person in the Raider Smith Tarot um, is looking blindlessly uh, towards a horizon point, like without like seeing and forging this path, but doing it in a way of stubbornness. Um, and these aspects of oppression um, create blockages to our own power of our conviction our philosophies or ideologies and mode of expanding with each other. And the only way out um, is to learn how to maintain security and stability while still struggling for our own autonomy and freedom. And so I made my own interpretation with the centerfold picture of um, indigenous medicine that my grandmother has taught me with astralagus root and ginger. And it brought me to a similar um, Thought, line of thought in how there's a lot of talk about food sovereignty right now. And I'm thinking more about what is like medicinal sovereignty, especially to indigenous peoples where in the first few weeks of the shelter in place, people are trying to find like elderberry and ginger and turmeric and all these other kind of immune boosting herbs um, and sharing that knowledge. But who has access to these herbs? Um, they're, they're in, in expensive in some ways. Some have been appropriated from white organizations and businesses that are selling them up like five times the market price. Some are um, harvested actually unethically and inhumanely. Um, and so what does like medicinal sovereignty actually look like for indigenous people in times like this? Um, and how can we actively shape our medicinal systems and healings rather than be shaped by it because of the market? place and the economy. Um, so that's me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Olivia, for that and for sharing like your thoughts. Um, and I think provoking us to really think about this question of what does what is medicinal sovereignty and all of the, in these alternative forms of healing that we should be centering and thinking through more that are connected to our communities. Um, so I'll shift over to Shahana Hanif um, as our next speaker. And Shahana just has taught me so much about what it means to build intentional friendships and relationships as a political practice, which I think is really key in this moment 
Um, so as background, Shahana is a Kensington-born community organizer, and she's running to represent Brooklyn's 39th district in the New York City Council. Very exciting. Um, and she is a core leader of the Bangladeshi Feminist Collective and co-founder of Bangladeshi Americans for Political Progress. She's also taught us so much about how to ground transnational feminist politics within local community organizing, and she'll be sharing more thoughts on community wellness and how policy is personal. Thank you so much. I was just telling Tiffany that um, I, I glammed up a little after many, many days. So I, I'm really, really grateful um, for the leadership of the Asian American Feminist Collective and for really giving me the booster I needed today. Um, so if I'm looking good because of you all. So thank you. Um, I'll begin with some gratitude for just all the ways we're practicing care work. Um, and I want to praise our feminist ancestors who knew femme, queer, trans, disabled, uh, and working class leadership would get us through the apocalypse. Um, when the quarantine began, I reminded myself of my own superpowers to get through whatever was coming. Was coming. I knew I contained the magical potions and real life lessons uh, guided by having lupus and uh, continuing to survive it. So I'll begin a little with just my personal story of, of survival. During Ramadan 12 years ago, uh, as a teenager, I waited hours in the emergency room at a public hospital in Brooklyn. And my mother accompanied me knowing very well I'd have to explain everything to her in Bangla. Neither of us expected lupus, um, which I didn't know that first night and no one uh, knew. And that night in, in the emergency room, I knew that my body was on fire and required hospitalization. Many days in the intensive care unit and with no timeline on how long I'd live in the hospital, I was told that what I have is lupus, a sacred illness that I can't even begin to explain in English, forget Bangla. But I knew that if I didn't interpret and translate how lupus was manifesting in my body and in my politics, I'd be abandoning my parents and our community. Um, because my time is limited, I want to go into a definition and just shift over to, to some policy talk. And, and I want to uh, do it in a, in a very um, simplified way because I know that policy talk is often jargon and unreadable and untranslatable. Um, and I want to begin with a language, uh, uh, language justice definition, and one of my favorites, um, which is by Communities Creating Healthy Environments. And this could be found in their language justice toolkit. Language justice is rooted in a history of resistance by communities and peoples whose voices and cultures have been suppressed for generations. Language justice is an alternative to that historical pattern of disenfranchisement and oppression. It affirms the fundamental rights of individuals and communities to language, culture, self-expression, and the equal participation. Language justice is a process of organizing and advocating to win proactive policies that will help achieve equity and have meaningful impacts across race and language. Language justice offers a vision of society that honors language and culture as fundamental human rights and which does not settle for providing more people for uh, for providing more people with access to the status quo, but rather alters institutions to provide space for full democratic participation. Now, the premise for my radical language justice platform and in our city is simple: that no one will be abandoned, no one is left behind in their share of fair and equitable care, and. Radical language justice is proactive in bringing in more people into our work. And I'm explicit about calling it language justice and not language access because leaving no one behind requires a shift in power and leadership. Our city has lazily rested on making things accessible. And this has never been by default. Immigrant communities have had to organize for basic language, just, language access. And despite our organizing, bringing language access laws and necessary policy changes in the city, we often find rooms with translation equipment with no one to interpret for. We find materials on agency websites that are not disseminated and without an outreach plan. 
And that's because language justice is hard and achieving it requires more than access. It requires building relationships and building trust and it takes years. But I've practiced some of it um, and an effective model during multilingual tenant organizing at an organization called CAV. And we'd host member meetings in four languages. This took intentional planning, volunteer capacity, rehearsals, equipment, and trust. Each section uh, at our meetings was led in one of our homeland languages. We used English only to pass the message to interpreters. Now, um, the, big, the big piece of my plan um, emphasizes that language justice requires funding. How many of us have stepped in as interpreters and have translated materials because we knew, we knew uh, that if this material about ICE, let's say, uh, in our neighborhood exists only in English and in the ethos of the World Wide Web, our communities will get picked up and families will get separated. Language access providers are frontline leaders. And I share more about this in my piece, and I'll share it in the chat, um, in my piece demanding funds for language justice in our COVID-19 mutual aid efforts, um, which if anyone's a part of the Mutual Aid NYC uh, network, if you are translating, you should be receiving a stipend because we made sure that that happens. And so the strategies we call to action uh, now and what we cultivate now for a just world during this, this pandemic should not be half-assed. We should, we should. So let's pay our language access providers. Um, it'll be frustrating and it's hard um, and it won't be easy, but I know that the revolution is an easy work. And I'll end my piece there. Amazing. Thank you so much, Shahana. Um, next, we have Cheresca Randario, and Cheresca is a Filipina American nurse, writer, amateur photographer, and usually everyone's favorite cousin. Um, earlier, Cheresca was talking about this before the event started that uh, she was part of our first ever virtual workshop on feminist history that we held digitally at Wing Luke at the start of social distancing in Washington State in early March. Um, so that's how we all got connected. And she was born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and also is a lover of the outdoors, great puns, and also her Chinese crested hairless dog. And so she'll be sharing with us some of her perspectives and experiences as a nurse on the front lines in Seattle. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Shrezka, and I wanted to thank the um, AFC for inviting me. Um, so I am a nurse in Seattle, and I'm just going to do a disclaimer. I do not speak for the institution that I work for. Um, I work as a pediatric nurse, and as a I think a lot of people know uh, COVID has dramatically affected the adult population a lot worse than the pediatric population. And I don't think it would be appropriate for me to appropriate the struggles of my other colleagues who are working in these adult institutions because they are truly suffering um, for how difficult caring for COVID patients are. But I will say when I wrote that, it was at the beginning of all of this and a lot has changed. A lot has changed for the better for some institutions. Um, including mine, and some have some things have also worsened. And I think what's important to remember in regards to healthcare is that everything trickles down. It's not just COVID patients, COVID families, and you know the things that happen to their bodies and their care, but it's also some of the other things people don't think about. So in the children's world right now, um, I have cared for a lot of patients whose family has been drastically affected by this. As a lot of people know, domestic abuse has gone up, and that is not just in romantic partners. That also includes abuse happening to children. So I have taken care of kids who have been hurt by their parents or by their siblings or by other people. I have also taken care of teenagers who are left alone in the hospital because their parents are ill. There are lots of things that trickle down in healthcare that I think are important to remember regarding COVID. Um, I, there we're seeing an increased spike in um, depression, anxiety, suicide ideation in children and, and in the teenage population. And all of that's interconnected to COVID and isolation and quarantine. So I think all of that's important to remember moving on. So I, I'll, I'll read what I had written at the beginning of this. Um, and the picture that you'll see when the next slide pops up is um, a picture that I actually took when I went to Safeway um, and 
things in Seattle at the beginning were not very good. Lots of the shelves are empty. Um, I can actually pull up what I have written, Tiffany, if it's not on here. Real quick. Um, in regards to like, uh, sorry, I'm like trying to figure out this reading thing. Um, but shelves are empty. There's no TP to be found. Masks were taken. And I think there's a lot of greed that was happening in society right now regarding healthcare and and access to things like hand sanitizer has been really, really hard. It's getting better for sure, but I think being on the front lines of healthcare has been, it's been very, very interesting. It's been very, very difficult. I'm trying to see how I can like read this and keep the screen up at the same time. One sec, sorry friends. Guys, you might need to exit out of full screen if that's also on. Okay. Oh, exit full screen. There we go. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll read what I have on there, um, just because I think it plays out a little bit more of what we were going through at the beginning. So um, I wrote, after coming down with cold symptoms, I went into early isolation, but was unable to get a test. When the prolonged sore throat turned into a cough, I went through so many hoops to obtain a test. I called my doctor's office, but they didn't have enough prote personal protective equipment to keep their staff safe for these COVID tests. I called public health and I didn't qualify because I was under the age of 60 and had no underlying conditions. But I am a nurse who lives with other nurses. I come into contact with babies and children. My roommates care for the elderly and vulnerable. While we went about um, our lives after my cold was over, we then learned that the virus is incubating and spreading rapidly among the young adult population with little to no symptoms at all. Our city went into lockdown and many of my friends and loved ones lost their jobs in one fell swoop. The restaurants that I worked for, my friends in the industry, artists in the city, they all lost their jobs and went without any income. Because of the greed of many in society, healthcare workers like me are out of supplies and need to keep ourselves, each other, and our patients safe. We're reusing disposable masks. We're running out of hand sanitizer and gloves. We're so short, we are so short-staffed that we are still required to come into work even when we've been exposed to the virus until we display symptoms. Every day that we go back into work, we then go home to our families and our communities and live with the guilt that we could potentially get them sick, and that weight is crushing. We are doing the best we can and we are professionals, but that does not mean we are immune to the horrors of our job, that we do not cry after seeing people die, that we do not feel rage at seeing our friends be so irresponsible and go out to bars and crowded restaurants. After learning that multiple doctors and nurses have contracted the virus, means that even with protection, we aren't safe. It feels like constant anxiety and terror, guilt and shame. Will we get sick, get our loved ones sick, get our non-COVID patients sick? How do we keep trudging on with no protection? One morning after rolling around in panic for hours, my partner asked, why are you reading so much? I replied, so I can be prepared. Prepared for what? Prepared for how much it's going to hurt. So I had written that kind of at the beginning um, and a lot has changed since then. My hospital has done a pretty good job of keeping us safe and now we've rolled out expanded testing for healthcare staff and for multiple patients and their families. Um, but throughout the country, as many of you have seen, there is not enough PPE um, for nurses, for doctors. Um, many, many hospital workers have died caring for COVID. Um, and I think it's just important in these times when people are protesting how, uh, how, how awful that hurts for us. We are, we are just asking for you guys to give us time, for these protesters to give us time so that our hospitals aren't overwhelmed. In Seattle, we're doing okay, but I know the East Coast is truly suffering from that right now. And I think it's important that everyone realize that we do have to be in this together to some degree. Um, and I think it's important that we protect the people on the front lines because lots of healthcare workers are also people of color who live with multiple family members in multi-generational homes. Um, so that's kind of my piece. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. Um, 
So we'll shift to our last speaker, Kim Chan. Um, Kim is a facilitator, writer, and organizer. Kim holds a PhD in ethnic studies from UC Berkeley, and her writing has been featured in Vice, Teen Vogue, PRI, and Ms. Magazine. And for me, Kim's writing on feminist politics has really, really shaped the way that I've thought about organizing and solidarity. And I'm super excited for the book manuscript that she's working on titled The End of Allyship, A New Era of Solidarity. And so she'll be reading an excerpt from her piece, Racism That Bridges, and also sharing some thoughts on how we build systems of support and solidarity for each other in this moment and beyond. Um, thank you so much, Rachel, for that generous introduction. Um, I, throughout the weeks, have continued to be so grateful to the collective for the work that they're doing. Um, I'm going to be totally honest and say this is the only writing that I've done that has been rooted and free flowing. Um, so I'm so kind of indebted to you all for the space. Um, a little bit of background on this piece. A few weeks before the shelter in place began, my partner and I um, were in Southeast Asia in a country that is rapidly criminalizing queer and trans folks. Um, and we came home and because COVID-19 had already kind of started um, taking root in the world, we self-isolated um, and then it got a lot more prominent and then the shelter in place happened. And as all of these simultaneous pieces of anti-Asian racism and queer precarity in a place that was really, thinking about whether or not it's legal to be in my body and be in my relationship. Um, the thing that kept coming to mind for me was this idea of precarity. Um, and for a lot of queer folks, I think precarity is our inheritance. It's the connective tissue of our community. Um, and it's also the bedrock of solidarity. And I wound up writing about this way that precarity and grief and our own vulnerability opens us up to new possibilities for solidarity. Um, that for folks who often look like me, who read as straight um, and are light skinned, we didn't have that before. Um, and so this is really for me a piece about what I learned um, and the new world that's possible when we start experiencing forms of fear that we didn't have before. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit from it um, and we'll start here. Every day I read the same Wikipedia page. It was created 50 days ago, two weeks after I first heard about COVID-19 three weeks before I came home from Southeast Asia and 42 days before the beginning of the indefinite quarantine from which I now write. The page lists hundreds of incidents of hatred aimed at people who look like me. They're set in schoolyards, supermarkets, and office cubicles around the world. They force me to reconsider what I know of racism and bodies that look like mine. As a child, racist incidents were few and far between. A war veteran screaming about my mother's country. A lit cigarette flung in my direction alongside a casual slur. But in the last few weeks, the seeds those early moments planted have sprouted anew. The first time a white woman grabbed her bags and briskly walked away from me, I was incensed. The third time, it dawned on me that the roots of a tree planted in 1882, 1917, and 1942 were bearing fruit once again. What can we do with our immediate and pressing racial terror? What do we make of our newfound sense of precarity and public space? What do we do with the news stories, the Wikipedia pages, the tweets, we remember. 
We remember that our honorary whiteness was and is always provisional. We remember that what for us feels like novel moments of violation are for many perfunctory. The fee for being in public space in their skin. We remember that white supremacy binds all communities of color in its violent expression. We remember that there are those for us for whom the experience of being in this vulnerable and violable world, whether behind bars or without shelter, is a daily reality. We remember that in our deliberate and intentional exclusion from the American imaginary, we are also bound. We are bound as those who endure injustice in all of its forms to free ourselves and our communities who also know our fears. We remember that racism can either be a bridge or a wall, and it's up to us to build and travel across our difference toward liberation. Thank you, Kim, for that. Um, we'll do a collective breathing exercise at the end, but I also invite everyone to take a deep breath together with me right now. And just take a moment to pause. I'd really love to just to thank all of our speakers again for sharing their thoughts, their words with us, um, and sharing the space together with us and like providing us with a lot of provocation and things to think about in this moment and things that we can carry with us out of this space. And so what we'll do now in the remaining time that we have is shift towards a moderated q and I know with a lot of people in the room, like having a real like discussion and digging deep um, into the zine is less feasible. So really inviting um, you to hopefully do that like in spaces that you're part of. But what we'll do is use the chat for people to be able to ask questions and we'll pull from these to ask the um, we'll pull from these to ask either the speakers or just to pull the room. Um, so what you can do is direct questions to individual contributors or just to the general audience. Um, so to a contributor, you might say like, at Saloni, can you share more about like tuberculosis and socioeconomic disparity or something like that? Um, and so just to make sure that you flag that and I'll read from those and then we also invite all of you to respond to questions via the chat and just to share some of those thoughts and we'll also be reading some of those responses out loud. Um, so please add questions to the chat. Again, practice patience with us as we're experimenting how to hold space together um, and we'll do a stop at in around 15 minutes to do a collective breathing exercise. Um, so we have the first question from Kenna, um, open to any of the speakers and for people to contribute in the chat. Uh, what are some online ways that we can advocate for a, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities? Like what are some petitions and resources that people wanna uplift? So please feel free to share those in the chat and contributors like feel free to unmute yourselves and share out loud with everyone. Um, can I chime in unless there was someone who was like waiting? Cool. Yes. Um, I'm thinking a lot in this moment of movements, how this is making our movements even more important. Um, and for me, there's not much that's new here. There's just a, a affirmation of commitment to movements that are already taking place. Um, of course, I think everything that we do is intersectional, but now the work that we're doing becomes even vital in areas like abolition, um, thinking about really big disparities within Asian American communities. Like, you know, if we're looking at things like pay equity, Hmong women, Cambodian women make as much or less than Black and Latinx women. Um, and so this moment, I think, has really made me even more interested in growing things like prison abolition and ending immigrant detention. Um, because the folks that we're seeing be most impacted are folks who are already kind of like working through those kinds of issues in real time.
Thanks so much for sharing, Tim. Other folks who might want to share um, other resources. And again, please feel free to share, like some, like drop some links, et cetera, into the chat. Um, going off what you just said, um, uh, activism is usually at least portrayed in the media as going outside and congregating in the streets, which is vital, but um, not accessible to almost anyone now, but um, not accessible to a lot of people day to day. So um, things like phones apps um, are what immediately come to mind. Um, there's one unfortunately, almost every day, every hour right now, um, where there's a call put out on Twitter to call, you know, the chief of police or the mayor or something to try to advocate for um, imprisoned communities, immigrant communities, um, et cetera. And so if you're looking for um, a pretty accessible way into um, directly advocating for people, um, that's what comes immediately to mind. Um, I'll drop some uh, links to good accounts to follow uh, in the chat who are uh, like calling on that kind of work. Thank you, Matilda. Um, maybe as a follow up to that too, um, if anyone in the chat or also wants to respond directly for some suggestions of where to donate some stimulus money to Asian American and Pacific Islander communities hit hardest by COVID-19 in New York City. Um, and one of them that I'll boost is in the zine. Um, Tiffany has really written some great resources for uh, mutual aid for sex workers. So that is definitely a starting place um, for folks. And there will be, as Tiff just said, some links and memos on the last slide, but also opening it up for people to respond to that. One of my other favorites is Dumplings Against Hate, um, which is an initiative um, uh, just collecting the community funds required to prevent the displacement of so many incredible um, and life sustenance uh, to our New York City Chinatowns. And I know there are some chapters across uh, some cities in the U.S. So Dumplings Against Hate, which started really before um, anyone knew what the quarantine would mean. Um, so it's both a political uh, effort while also um, directing funds to restaurants. And we know that the stimulus efforts for small businesses um, are not reaching immigrant and ethnic uh, small businesses and restaurants. So we've had to really pick up and, and step up in ways that we might not um, know uh, how best to do, but Dumplings Against Hate has been a critical resource for me. So if you're looking to put your money somewhere um, let's uh, really uh, support our Chinatowns. Sahana, uh, we also have a question from Kara about how we can support language justice in our communities. Do you mind adding on a little bit about that? Sure. So Mutual Aid NYC is definitely stipending um, translators. If you're working with anyone who is offering translation, I would also suggest that you uh, give them a few coins. Um, it's really critical now to, to just have a practice of, of giving money to our language access providers who, again, are frontline leaders of this work. And we're seeing it really, um, we're seeing it loud and clear in our mutual aid works. Because uh, a lot of the calls I'm addressing, um, these are not people who will fill, fill out a a web form, even if the translated version of a web form is available. So we really have to reroute how we do this work. And many of the translation providers I work with are now out of jobs or are undocumented and will not be receiving stimulus checks. Um, soon, I'm just waiting for this fundraiser that I'm launching um, to go live. I've had about Right now, we're at 29 undocumented Bangladeshis because I'm also seeing that there's um, a real lack in in organizations or like there's we're seeing that organizations that should be providing support to um, ethnic communities don't exist right now. And we're kind of just like quickly scattering uh, resources um, to provide boosters. It's not enough. We really have to think about um, sustaining this work 
and, and thinking strategically on how we sort of get through this, but make sure that when the pandemic is over, that we'll, we've got the, the structures in place to survive forever. So I will share that when that's ready. Um, and, and I know our friends at Queen's Mutual Aid, that's another great place to put your money um, towards. They've been delivering, and, and the core members are all Bangladeshi Muslim. They've been coordinating uh, deliveries. They've surpassed more than 300 in the last six weeks. Uh, they're trying to make sure that they have the funds necessary. Thank you. Um, and then I just want to raise it in case it got lost in the tweet. Feel free to respond. Um, those of you who are in San Francisco in the Bay Area, Jessica wants to get connected with pre-existing groups. So if anyone is plugged into things there to share some area-based resources. Um, and I know just to be mindful of everyone's time and we'll try to think about ways that we can have more collective discussions, maybe a closing question for people to share in the chat and for our speakers to share as well if they feel called to do so uh, before the breathing exercise is how everyone is taking care of themselves during this moment. And so just any strategies from either bubble baths to a trashy TV show, everything on the table, snuggling your pet who may or may not want to be snuggled, um, things like that, but to share in the chat. Um, and if a couple of our speakers can share their strategies for care right now would be great. This is really silly, but I have been clapping at seven every day. I think we're also clapping for ourselves. So I am gonna just step away and do that very briefly while we all meet, but I wanna hear all your strategies too. I'm just confessing and sharing that it's like the non-negotiable of my day. So even if I'm on a Zoom meeting, I like make everyone clap. <laughs> Other folks, I will just invite maybe our speakers to share their, like their strategies. And in the order of my screen, um, maybe Matilda, Cherezka, Olivia um, to start and then Kim. I can go for a little bit. I think it's also important to remember like while we're in quarantine, some people feel the need to be productive or to like learn a new skill or something in this time because we have all this time. But I think with this is a very traumatizing event for everybody, no matter what you do or what role you play. And I think it was really helpful for me to remember that just existing and being healthy is enough for right now. And I think people are beating themselves up because like I should be productive in this time. If you're safe and the loved ones that you have are safe, then I think that's good enough. Thank you. I think I agree. Um, I'm in an MFA program right now. Um, I think a lot of people here are currently involved in academia in some way. So that pressure is definitely there. Um, I am getting back in touch with my original art practice, which is making dumb clothing badly, um, which I'm really enjoying. Uh, so I've stopped hemming things. And it's very specific, but that is my self-care. <laughs> so not hem things correctly. Um, and then, I mean, I'm trying to rely on strategies that have been important to keeping my body going uh, even before all this, which is like having a bedtime, setting timers for meals because my body doesn't tell me when it's hungry, that kind of thing. Um, but so, um, and I mean, what I also remind people uh, in the group that I run um, for young adults with chronic illnesses and disabilities is to not punish yourself for your circumstances or for how your body's feeling or for how you're reacting to something because there's those things are even if they are within your control and you want to work on changing them punishing yourself for the present won't help um yeah and then i'll pass it to the next person um i've been cooking a lot, but not just cooking. Um, I've been making ancestral food. Um, so things that my grandmother taught my mother that I'm now making, um, and I'm finding a lot of resilience in that because these recipes have survived so many wars. They've survived displacement and violence and imperialism and, um, there's something somatic about the smell of lemongrass having survived all of that and knowing that these kinds of rituals will endure. 
Thank you. And then Olivia Shahana, if you wanted to share, no pressure. Um, probably tending to the plants in my living proximity. <laughs> I have a lot of plants, so I'm thankful for them. And I try and speak and sing to them and get my hands in the dirt. Um, and do altar work. I have an altar with my grandmothers on it. And um, I think right now I miss them more than I have in a really long time. Um, and so being called to that ancestral work and the spiritual plane is really integral at this time, especially when spirit is really abound right now, um, every day, probably on an hourly basis. Um, and so people that are becoming ancestors as we speak um, and holding space for that honoring and that reverence and maintaining humility, I think, of all else. Thank you. Um, so what we can do just to close out the space together, um, we'll pull up a slide with just um, some additional links. And just as a follow up, we do have your email addresses like from the event. And so we'll share a follow up with you all um, with some of the links from the chat. So it's all reassembled together. Uh, so we'll definitely do that. And then I'll pass it over to Saloni to end us with a collective breathing exercise. Um, so people can go on to their meals, um, to the different things that they want to do for the rest of the evening or afternoon. So I'll pass it to Saloni to close us out. So um, I'm not sure if you can hear, my neighborhood really goes all out for the 7 p.m. clapping. Um, and it brings me a great deal of joy. So I know people feel all sorts of ways about it. Um, but this breathing exercise, I, so I was halfway through a yoga teacher training before we all got quarantined um, and began to self-isolate. So I just wanna say beforehand, I'm not a licensed breathing practitioner, um, but I have found a great deal of comfort in this exercise. Um, it's called Nadi Shodhana, and basically your Nadis are your channels, so you're clearing out your channels and kind of um, approaching the rest of your day with a sense of equanimity, a sense of calm, um, and I've really liked it. So you will have to touch your face, so please make sure you've washed your hands. Um, and you can either do like, uh, your thumb over one nostril and your two fingers over your other. Or I actually like this um, and find it pretty common. You could do your thumb here, your two fingers in the middle of your forehead where your like, third eye would go, and then your pinky and your ring finger covering the other nostril. And I won't do it with you all so that you can see me while it's happening. Um, but basically we're gonna alternate which nostril we're breathing out of. Um, so let's just take one breath in Hold and exhale together. And then um, cover your right nostril. We're gonna breathe in with our left nostril. One, two, three, four. Cover both your nostrils and just hold it at the top. You can touch your third eye if you'd like. And just kind of um, feel yourself get a little bit bigger. And then release your right nostril and exhale through the, so it should be the opposite nostril. One, two, three, four, five, hold it under. We're gonna go again from inhaling through your right nostril. So inhale one, two, three, four, hold at the top. Exhale through your left nostril. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold it under at the bottom. And then we're gonna inhale through our left nostril. One, two, three, four, hold at the top. And feel a sense of your lungs getting bigger. Hold at the top, exhale through your right nostril. One, two, three, four, five, six. So 
then we can just kind of, you can take your hands off your face. Um, you can, if you had more time, you could even practice doing that without the hands on your face and just kind of visualize inhaling through one nostril, exhaling through the other. And what I like doing is kind of imagining it as a cleansing breath. So you're kind of inhaling all the things you want, you're holding at the top and you're exhaling things you don't. Um, but there are all sorts of, you know, language of purity and pollution that we can use or not use depending on how we feel. Um, I'm still interrogating all of that every day too. Um, but I hope it helps you feel calm. It's been a really great way for me to self-soothe in these moments where I felt pretty anxious um, and just take your pulse down a little bit. But thank you all for being here with us. This was so lovely. What a nice group. You're all like hyping everyone up in the comments. I'm just so thrilled. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a great Thank evening. You all. We hope to connect with you again soon. Night. Bye. Thanks, folks.